New York Times best-selling author Lisa Jackson is back with another bone-chilling story our listeners will love. In the new novel, Ruthless, dangerous secrets, bitter jealousy, and vengeance hide just beneath the surface. Ruthless is on sale now everywhere books are sold. For more information, visit lisajackson.com. Due to the graphic nature of this killer's crimes, listener discretion is advised. This episode includes dramatizations and discussions of murder and assault that some people may find offensive. We advise extreme caution for children under 13. It's April 24, 1997. A small rural village outside of Maiden, the capital of North Sumatra, Indonesia. Sugarcane fields sprinkle the tropical landscape. Cricket sound locals pray. All seem to be calm. 21-year-old Sri Kamala Dewi, a peaceful and kind girl, feels lost and in need of spiritual guidance. Who better to talk to than the local sorcerer, the spiritual leader of her jungle town and maiden? Surely the sorcerer could give her advice, saying a few healing prayers, and finally cure her insecurities. So Sri Kamala asks her 15-year-old friend Andreas to drive her the far distance to the sorcerer's remote location, deeper into the jungle. Sri Kamala feels embarrassed for needing spiritual guidance, so she asks Andreas to keep this journey a secret. After her sorcery session, she would figure out a way back home herself. Unfortunately, Andreas would be the last person to see her live, or rather, the last sane person to see her live. Within hours, she would be brutally strangled to death and buried in a sugarcane field. Three days later, all of the stars aligned just right. After several nights of heavy rain, a young farmer wandered into that same sugarcane field in search of food for his livestock. With the topsoil washed away, a peculiar mound was perfectly visible, and this young farmer wandered closer and closer. (gasps) He found Sri Kamala Dewi's naked and decomposing body, her hands tied behind her back her throat brutally strangled to death. A shocking travesty that shook this young farmer and the entire community. Yet this was just the beginning. An unthinkable wave of horror was only moments away from crashing onto this small Indonesian town. Sri Kamala Dewi was just one of 42 girls found in this mass grave. Hi, I'm Greg Polson, and this is Serial Killers. Today, we're going to take a deep dive into the life of Ahmad Saraji and the fascinating world of Indonesian sorcery. I'm here with my co-host, Vanessa Richardson. Vanessa is not a licensed psychologist or psychiatrist, but she's done a lot of research for the show. Hi, everyone. We'd like to ask a quick favor. Would you leave a five-star review of Serial Killers on your favorite podcast directory? It seems so simple, but it really helps us out. And don't forget to subscribe while you're there, because a new episode comes out every Monday. You can also find us on Facebook and Instagram at Parcast, and on Twitter at Parcast Network. Now, let's get back to the case of Ahmad Siraji. Ahmad Siraji, the sorcerer from hell, admitted to killing 42 women aged 17 to 40 from the years of 1986 to 1997, Yet many believe Siraji may have killed even dozens more. His maniacal murder spree all began with a bizarre dream in 1986 that led Siraji to become a sorcerer, a mystic healer for his community. Though others may have respected him as a selfless spiritual leader, Siraji had a single goal in mind. Murder 70 women and slurp each of their saliva. After drinking the saliva of exactly 70 murdered women, he believed he would then become all-powerful, invincible. Siraji's motives were unusual. He was also, to say the least, an unusual man. The following is a direct quote from Siraji. We are all human beings. We have our strengths and weaknesses. And if I remember correctly, I've murdered 42 women." End quote. As we will soon discover, Siraji developed an obsession with his own strengths and weaknesses. Throughout our dissection of this murderer, I hope to deeply analyze this quote. How is it possible that a murderer might not remember his number of victims? 
Does Siraji view his murderous ability as a personal strength or a personal weakness? In his mind, what is his weakness? Let's begin our examination of Siraji with a greater understanding of exactly what it meant to be a sorcerer in 20th century Indonesia. As we'll see, sorcery and magic played a pivotal role in developing Siraji's bizarre motives. But also, Siraji used his respected status as a sorcerer as his primary method for both luring and killing his victims. Clearly, before we can analyze Siraji's specific case, we must first understand much more about the role of sorcery in Indonesia's culture. In general, sorcery refers to black magic, wizardry, and witchcraft. However, a sorcerer in modern-day society would more likely be someone who claims to use magic spells or summon supernatural spirits in order to cure people's problems. A sort of spiritual healer. You could say that. Magic's relationship with religion is a very complex subject, but yes, a sorcerer would likely claim to have some sort of spiritual ability to fix problems beyond scientific understanding. In our next episode, we'll take an in-depth look at the specific methods, spells, and rituals sorcerers use. We'll see exactly why and how women believed Siraji might have fixed their problems. But for now, let's focus more on a broad historical and cultural understanding of how sorcery impacted Siraji's background. Sorcery is clearly not prevalent in Western culture, so it makes sense that sorcery more greatly affected Siraji, as his family lived in rural Indonesia. And for numerous reasons, the role of spirituality and magic has a long history in Indonesia, greater than in other Asian cultures. Indonesian sorcery primarily stemmed from the Java region, one of the largest Indonesian islands. Where Siraji's family is from. That's right. Most of Java is made up of agricultural areas, and as most Javanese people are historically farmers, they were greatly influenced by indigenous farming rituals to attempt to control weather and natural disasters. Without a scientific understanding of nature, Javanese people were also very superstitious. Occurrences like a drought can now be explained through environmental sciences, but in historic Java, they relied on mystical explanations and witchcraft. So then those spiritual-based farming rituals naturally impacted the mindset and future culture of the Javanese people. These indigenous practices, in a sense, led to an increased belief in magic-based healing, like on a personal level. Exactly. A blend of several religions is another factor that increased the presence of spirituality and magic in Indonesia. One of the primary historic religions of the Java region was known as the Abangan religion, which was mostly prevalent in the so-called peasant class. This religion blended indigenous polytheistic beliefs with aspects of Hinduism, Islam, and Buddhism. Most importantly for our understanding, this Abangan religion preached that natural spirits live throughout our environment and that a sorcerer's magical ability can channel these spirits and cure people's problems. Another very similar term for sorcerer is shaman. Shamans, called dukun in Indonesia, claimed to channel transcendental energy and spirits down into our physical world in order to increase healing. Both shamans and sorcerers use some sort of magic or spirituality to heal people's problems, and both were trusted and respected members of society. But wait, exactly how common was all this magic-based healing? Did the majority of Indonesian people engage in it? In general, belief in magic healing was very common in Indonesia back in the 70s and 80s. Each individual obviously believed in the power of spiritual healing to varying degrees, so there are not known exact percentages of people who participated in spiritual healing. However, magic-based healing was popular enough in Indonesia that more than 50 people in Siraji's small village actively sought him out. And current Indonesian shamans claim to hear from desiring patients every single day. Oftentimes, shaman and sorcerers are even used in conjunction with modern doctors. So in other words, spiritual healing was very much a part of mainstream culture in Indonesia. Exactly. Spiritual healing was not some crazy radical idea that only affected a few people. Magic and spirituality is deeply ingrained in Indonesian culture. With a greater understanding of Siraji's world, let's dive into his disturbed childhood. We just heard how prevalent sorcery and shamanism-based magic practices were in Indonesia in the mid-20th century. But sorcery first made its way into Siraji's life in his early childhood. Siraji's father worked as a subsistence farmer, and more significantly, a local sorcerer. 
It's worth noting that the official record keeping in Indonesia was not up to par in the mid 20th century. So some of the facts surrounding Siraji's childhood and family life are a bit mysterious. In fact, several reputable news sources have even reported Siraji having different birth dates. Some say January 10th, 1949, while others reported December 12th, 1952. We will see how Indonesia's lack of institutional organization affected Siraji's future crimes, his ability to fly under the radar, and even the bizarre aftermath of his arrest. Nevertheless, we can be sure that Siraji's father had a great influence on his life. Most significantly, there have been reports that Siraji's sorcerer father was abusive to Siraji as a young child. That's hardly surprising to hear that a serial killer was abused as a child. As we've discovered time and time again, many serial killers suffered traumatic childhoods. It has also been said that Siraji faced frequent bullying as a child from his peers. The combination of his father's abuse and peer bullying likely led Siraji to feel deeply weak, to have a low self-esteem. This surely tied into his motive to kill women and drink their saliva. In Siraji's mind, if he could slurp the saliva of 70 dead women, he would be granted an invincible superpower, the ability to never get hurt. Someone who so desperately wants to be invincible is likely someone who has also felt much pain in their past. Yes, oftentimes people's most obsessive goals are a sign of their deepest insecurities. And not only did Siraji seek power and respect through this imagined superhuman invincibility, but he'd also eventually strive to be a respected leader in his town. Unfortunately, being a beloved spiritual healer for his community would not be enough to overcome his childhood trauma. He'd eventually search for power in a much more harmful way, too. But first, Vanessa, there's something else I'm curious about relating to his father. If Siraji's father was abusive and clearly not a good role model, then I find it interesting that Siraji ultimately copied his father's profession and became a sorcerer. Here's something we want to share with you. If you haven't caught up on the critically acclaimed first season of The Good Fight, it's not too late. But you might want to avoid your co-workers, because I guarantee they'll be talking about season two, which premiered on March 4th. I know all of us at ParCast have been talking about it. From award-winning executive producers Michelle and Robert King, season two of The Good Fight is set in a world that is going insane. Diane, Luca, Maya, and the rest of the Chicago-based law firm find themselves under psychological assault when a client at another firm kills his lawyer. Then there's a copycat murder. The firm starts becoming suspicious of its own clients. Discover the drama, the excitement, the scandal, and get yourself geared up for season two, available only on CBS All Access. Hurry to cbs.com slash serial killers for your free trial of CBS All Access. And get caught up now ahead of the season premiere on March 4th. That's cbs.com slash serial killers for your free trial of CBS All Access. Watching a great thriller like The Good Fight or listening to bone-chilling stories on serial killers might make you a little on edge. We recommend Ring to ease your fears and keep your home and your family secure. Ring offers video doorbells that allow you to see and respond to visitors with your smartphone, adding not only security, but convenience. And if you need to, you can set off an alarm right from your phone. And the new Ring Floodlight Cam features HD video and two-way audio that lets you know the moment anyone steps on your property. I love that Ring helps keep my family safe. I use Ring to keep an eye on my packages when I'm away all day. It's also nice to always know what's going on at home, even if I'm not there. And now, as a listener, you can save up to $150 off a Ring of Security Kit. When you go to ring.com slash serial killers, up to 150 off at ring.com slash serial killers. That's ring.com slash serial killers. Now, let's get back to the story. Ahmad Siraji has been quoted saying, quote, My father also knew some sorcery, and I aspired to follow in his footsteps, end quote. What does this say about the relationship between Ahmad Siraji and his father? How could Siraji admire someone who abused him? 
While it might not make logical sense for an abused child to follow in the footsteps of their abusive parent, it is unfortunately more common than you might think. According to a Yale psychology study, 30% of abused children will go on to abuse their own children. It's rather predictable for any child to mimic their parents' behavior to live similar future lives as them. We learn about the world through watching our parents. Though severely abused children clearly have more incentive to drastically change lifestyles, it unfortunately is not always the case. So in Siraji's case, even though he may have suffered much torment from his own father, Siraji still might have admired him in other realms and sought a similar career. And in a perverted sense, perhaps it was his father's abuse that even further pushed Siraji into following in his sorcery footsteps. Maybe Siraji felt so damaged by his father that he subconsciously sought to cure his pain by finally winning his father's approval. If he followed all of his father's bizarre advice, if he lived a very similar lifestyle and career as his father, maybe his father would finally love him or stop his abuse. That makes sense. Clearly, Siraji's eventual decision to become a sorcerer was closely tied into his complex relationship to his father. His relationship with his mother, Sartik, was perhaps less tumultuous, but also a bit peculiar. Sartik was a housewife devoted to Islam. Even late into Siraji's life, Sartik seemed preoccupied with his son following her version of Islam, including who he was allowed to marry. Under her personal interpretation of Islam, she viewed polygamy as acceptable, except in the case of a man marrying women who were sisters. This is all to say that Siraji's mother followed her own understanding of Islamic teachings with a very detailed, fine-tuned lens. This, though, brings about an interesting question. How exactly did Islam and sorcery mesh in Indonesia in the mid-20th century? How might that have worked for Siraji's father to be a magic-using sorcerer and his mother to be a devout Muslim? Firstly, it's important to note that religious beliefs often vary quite drastically between countries and cultures. So any information provided about Islam that is specific to Siraji's culture is likely different than Muslim customs around the world. Great point. And today, we'll be focusing on just Javanese-rooted Islam, the subset that affected Siraji's life in Indonesia. In fact, Indonesia has a larger Muslim population than any other country in the world, with about 87% of Indonesians currently identifying as Muslim. Regarding the juxtaposition of sorcery and Islam, that's a complex subject. According to most Islamic scholars, sorcery is actually entirely forbidden by Islam. So how did Siraji's parents navigate that conflict? A devout Muslim and a practicing sorcerer don't sound like they traditionally go together. Well, there are variations of most religions that include more magical and mystical elements, whether it be Christian mysticism or Jewish Kabbalah. Similarly, some Muslims, especially in Siraji's parents' home in Java, believe in an Islamic mysticism. As we briefly discussed, the ancient Javanese people were highly animistic, believing that everything has a spiritual soul. So in the mid-20th century, these more mystic, magic-based beliefs blended with Islam. So most likely, Siraji's whole family identified as Muslim, but practiced a sort of mixture of Islam and ancient mystic spirituality. Unfortunately, we cannot be 100% sure of how Siraji's mother felt about her husband and son's sorcery, but it does seem most likely that their belief systems blended together. Either way, it seems that Siraji was more greatly influenced by his abusive, mystical father than his seemingly docile Islamic mother. But Siraji wasn't just influenced by his parents. As an adolescent, he became involved with the worst group of peers. The following quote about Siraji is from Siraji's childhood neighbor. I was here since 1962. We grew up together and even played when we were kids. However, he started to grow evil, evil in the sense that he committed thefts and got into fights." End quote. After facing his father's abuse and troubled psyche, Siraji eventually ran away from home. On his own, he had to fend for himself and find his place in a world that seemed increasingly cruel. By the time he was only 19 years old, he became so unhinged that he engaged in frequent theft and violent behavior. This would eventually lead to his arrest and a 10-year prison sentence. After he was released at age 31, he briefly became a cattle breeder. However, he would soon be jailed once again for cattle theft. This would unfortunately be his last time in prison before his rampant murder spree began. 
As we've discussed in previous episodes, most serial killers dabble in increasingly serious crimes before murder. It's very common for serial killers to be violent children and law-breaking young adults. However, it's interesting that Suraji was specifically caught and arrested on two separate occasions. Many notable serial killers may have committed early crimes, but they avoided capture. Especially in America, if a man was previously jailed for violent crime, he would more likely be on an investigator's watch list by the time of his murders. One would think that Siraji, a previously violent criminal, would surely have been a possible suspect when dozens of women disappeared from a small town. However, as we've seen, the record-keeping in Indonesia was not always quite up to par, and as Siraji simply developed a new persona, he clearly went unnoticed by authorities. He was able to hide his criminal past as he became such a trusted and respected leader in his community. I'm wondering how you think this prison time might have affected him. Prison affects each individual differently. While prison might reform some criminals, it clearly did not reform Siraji, who became a mass serial killer soon after leaving jail. If we dissect Siraji's apparent insecurities and childhood, the effect of his prison time might become clearer. We know that Siraji had a troubled childhood in which he faced abuse. We can also deduce that he suffered from feeling powerless and weak throughout most of his life. So then we can ask ourselves how those insecurities might have been either heightened or mended in prison. It seems rather clear that they were only heightened in prison. From just looking at Siraji, he's not a big guy. He's small and very thin. It's doubtful that he found power and respect while in jail. Yes, he was likely surrounded by more negative influences. I'd postulate that he was only made to feel weaker and smaller in prison. Perhaps he even experienced further bullying, if you will. Maybe his prison time was the straw that broke the camel's back. Maybe this final experience of feeling powerless and breakable is what led him to seek ultimate power by killing innocent women. Though prison was meant to reform him, or at the least keep him away from society, it did just the opposite. It's certainly an interesting theory. Are there any other notable serial killers who spent time in jail right before their murder spree? Yes, the most notorious one would be Charles Manson, a cult leader who led the murdering of seven people in 1969. But before creating his murderous commune, Manson similarly had a tumultuous childhood in which he actually faced juvenile detention and jail several times before his mass murdering. At the age of 13, he committed a string of burglaries and ended up at a juvenile detention center, a jail for kids and teens. There, he claims that other inmates brutalized him sexually until he eventually escaped. And did this terrible experience in prison possibly also factor into his future desire to murder? Well, it's hard to be exactly sure what leads anyone to commit such atrocities, but increased trauma in one's childhood certainly doesn't help their future psyche, and this wouldn't be the end of Manson's jail time. He would soon return to prison for crimes including transporting stolen cars, failing to appear at court, and forging checks. By his release in March of 1967, Manson, a 32-year-old man, had spent over 16 years in prison and other similar institutions. And his murder spree began about two years after his release in 1969? That's right. With more than half of his rather young life spent behind bars, he clearly learned about the world from other criminals. His peers were consistently poor influences. Though we can't necessarily blame prison for turning him into a monster, his repeated prison time clearly did not reform him or teach him to be a better person. And significantly, it was during his time in prison that Manson developed his religious philosophy. It was these ideas that he would eventually preach to his group of murderous followers, known as the Manson family. There are clearly similarities between these two killers. Not only did they spend much of their early years in prison for theft, but they also both started murdering soon after their release from prison. And both of their murder sprees were somewhat cult-like. Manson created a quasi-commune of murderers who followed his rogue ideas about religion and spiritual philosophy. And though Siraji didn't exactly create a cult, he was similarly driven by bizarre spiritual goals. And he also used cult-like rituals to gain followers. And thinking about both of these killers who clearly did not benefit from time in jail in their youth, I'm wondering, is there any more effective way society can prevent the development of serial killers? Or a better way of assessing when people should be released from jail? 
clearly Saraji should not have been allowed back into society. Well, there are all sorts of theories about how to best deter violent crime. In my opinion, there's nothing anyone could do to entirely prevent the problem of serial killers. However, it certainly couldn't hurt to make society more aware of early warning signs. Like causing harm to animals? Precisely. And then having increased mental health resources for parents and children. It certainly makes sense to help a disturbed child before he reaches a breaking point. Siraji's breaking point seemed to come soon after his release from prison, when he was still in his early 30s. Forced to start a new life after his release, Siraji felt lost. He soon moved to North Sumatra, deep into the jungles. There he began training in sorcery. Now, a quick break for something lighter. For months, I was missing yoga classes because I couldn't find parking or got stuck in traffic. Now I can practice every day with Yoga Glow, and it's made such a difference in how I feel. Yoga Glow is online yoga and meditation that you can do anywhere by streaming right onto your devices for only $18 a month. I've spent more than that on one class at a traditional yoga studio. It's nice to be able to take as many classes as I want for a whole month at such a low price. I love that Yoga Glow features many of my favorite instructors like Catherine Budig, Elena Brower, and Jason Crandall. Since they offer classes at all experience levels, I can take it easy when I need to or I can challenge myself. And it doesn't take long to find the perfect class because navigating their platform is so easy. Get your first two weeks of Yoga Glow free when you sign up on yogaglow.com slash serial killers. That's yoga, G-L-O, dot com slash serial killers for two weeks free. Yogaglow.com slash serial killers. And if you're wondering what to listen to after you finish this episode of Serial Killers, you need to check out the new ParCast podcast, Unexplained Mysteries. Every Thursday, our friends Richard and Claire explore the greatest mysteries of history and life on Earth. From the building of Stonehenge to the subject of the Mona Lisa, they search for answers to the unanswered questions on the past and present. Search for Unexplained Mysteries on your favorite podcast directory to start listening now. Or visit Parcast, P-A-R-C-A-S-T dot com slash unexplained to listen now. Now, let's get back to the story. Ahmad Siraji's years training in the North Sumatran jungles remain largely mysterious. Unfortunately, there is no known documentation of his time there, and we do not know exactly who trained him or how he learned sorcery. But Vanessa, how are sorcerers and shamans usually trained? Well, firstly, in regards to all sorcerers and shamans, there isn't a single method of training. Each sorcerer uses his own highly varying array of methods, and there's not a single school of thought or textbook that teaches them. Given that, some shamans are trained in physical health practices. This can include midwifery, acupuncture, and massage therapy. So they wouldn't be given scientific medical training, per se. But instead, they might learn the most effective places to massage someone and the various home remedy style methods of massaging. These physical healing practices might also be combined with more spiritual theories of the body. For example, maybe massaging someone's foot will alleviate pain in her stomach. Shamans often learn these physical techniques from apprenticeships with more experienced shamans and by simply trying it themselves. Since they're not actually providing any medical surgeries or diagnoses, they can learn by trial and error. And how might one learn the magic spells and rituals involved in sorcery? Spirituality rituals seem to be a bit more common with Siraji's practice than with the physical aspects of shamanism. In order to become a spiritual sorcerer or shaman, it is first necessary to have a specific spiritual makeup. In other words, one must already be a spiritual person who, more or less, has an instinctual sense of magic in the world. Well, this seems rather subjective. Any person could claim to have this spiritual makeup. As a Westerner, I would agree. But if we fully buy into the practice of sorcery, the Indonesian teachings would tell us that there are certain individuals who are born simply better suited to channel spirits than others. Okay, so once someone accepts that they're naturally connected with the spirits and they would like to learn to be a professional sorcerer, what do they do next? They would most likely be trained by a senior dukun, an older and wiser shaman who acts as a teacher, leader, and role model. 
Each sorcerer's training vastly differs, but it might include extensive meditation, fasting, and repetitive chanting. All of these practices help to foster and focus the spirits within each sorcerer, helping them to better understand themselves and the world around them. With this clarity, sorcerers could then be more helpful in giving their patients advice and guidance. That sounds rational and similar to how some Buddhist monks and other religious leaders are trained. Mm -hmm, that's true. The difference exists in the discussions of magic and spirits that a sorcerer would have with his senior dukun. Whereas a training Buddhist monk might discuss human suffering and self-awareness, a training sorcerer is more likely to discuss how magical spirits impact their emotions and physical feelings. Also, their chants and prayers would be more about channeling spirits and less about a single deity. And in some cases, sorcerers might even digest special herbal medicines and potions that are believed to increase their potential for magic. Since Suraji spent the majority of his young adult life with little to no connection to magic, it seems more likely that his training would include some sort of this herbal medicine. And though we may not know much about the specifics of Suraji's training, we do know that he has said this. Quote, no, I did not learn sorcery from anyone else but my father. End quote. And again, we face the question of his bizarre relationship with his father. Clearly, his father acted as his senior dukun in guiding him throughout his spiritual training. We don't know how long his father guided him or how his father explicitly taught him. However, it's nonetheless fascinating that he claims all of his spiritual understanding came from the man that abused him. This also brings about the interesting question of the true motives behind why he became a sorcerer in the first place. Did he always plan on using sorcery as a sort of ruse to murder women? Was sorcery initially just a new way for him to make money, perhaps a new sort of con that wouldn't land him back in prison? Or was it in fact a genuine interest spawned from his desire to please his father and finally win his approval? Well, we can never know those answers for sure. It does seem to me that Ahmad Siraji's desire to learn sorcery stemmed from a genuine place. For whatever disturbed reason, he admired his abusive father and seemed to want to start a new life after his prison sentence. Making money illegally had clearly not worked for him in the past, so it makes sense that he resorted to the one lucrative and legal career he had experienced, his father's sorcery. And he eventually left his sorcery training in the jungle to return to his hometown in Maiden, Indonesia. For the next few years, he lived a seemingly normal life as a farmer part-time. He spent the rest of his time offering his services as a sorcerer to his neighbors. People soon believed that he was a brilliant sorcerer and with a great ability to heal their problems. Word of his powers quickly spread through his community and he became increasingly busy, eventually with a reportedly steady stream of clients. Even local businessmen and government agents came to see Siraji, now a respected leader of his rural community. It's rather surprising how he managed to appear to make such a turnaround after prison. It's amazing that he could convince his community that he was so reformed. He was previously an aggressive and troubled thief who spent more than a decade behind bars. That would not exactly strike everyone as a man who would make a great spiritual leader in society. That's a good point. So how do you suppose he convinced so many people? Well, for one, we know that many serial killers are experts at appearing normal. Whether they are convincing dozens of future victims to trust them or spending years avoiding capture, serial killers and sociopaths tend to be master manipulators. Siraji was no different. And we cannot be entirely sure if Siraji himself believed that he had magic powers to heal people or if it was all a simple con. But regardless, he clearly was very successful in convincing those around him that he did have powers. One way that many serial killers strive to appear normal is by maintaining normal family lives and a nice persona in their communities. And during this period between his prison time and his murder spree, Siraji did get married. In fact, he married three women at the same time. And if it's not surprising enough, all three of these women were sisters. Polygamy was actually not uncommon in Indonesia. It is still legal today. However, marrying women who were all sisters was abnormal. In a rare public interview, Siraji's mother had much to say about this. Quote, I wouldn't forbid him to marry two, three, four, five women, but not women who were siblings. As a Muslim, he shouldn't have done so. We advised him three times, but he was still unrepentant. End quote. 
I must say, it is a bit odd that our only comments made by Siraji's mother were about her disapproval over his marriages, not about his mass murders. But more light will be shed on his marriages next week, as we'll learn more about how all three of Siraji's wives would actually be accomplices to his brutal murders. We'll also finally hear about the bizarre dream that led to Siraji's horrific killing spree. We'll hear from Siraji himself about his disturbed motive to try and kill 70 women. And then slurp each of their saliva. We'll also dissect his ritualistic ways of murdering and burying these innocent women. We'll finally unearth the reasons why Siraji came to be known as the Sorcerer from Hell. Thanks again for tuning in to Serial Killers. If you want to listen to any previous episodes of Serial Killers, you can find them on iTunes, Google Play, SoundCloud, Stitcher, and Spotify, or on our website, parcast.com, spelled P-A-R-C-A-S-T dot com. If you like what you hear, please leave a five-star review or tell us what you think on social media. We're on Facebook and Instagram as at Parcast and Twitter at Parcast Network. It seems simple, but it really helps our show. Join us next Monday as we continue delving into the twisted psyche of Ahmad Siraji. Have a killer week. Serial Killers was created by Max Cutler, is a production of Cutler Media, and is part of the Parcast Network. It is produced by Max and Ron Cutler, sound designed by Ron Shapiro, with production assistance by Joel Stein and Carrie Murphy. Additional production assistance by Carly Madden and Maggie Admire. Serial Killers is written by Ryan Elkins and stars Greg Polson and Vanessa Richardson. 